Hi, here we're talking about matrix norms. So we've talked about norms before, and we when we talked about norms before, we were talking about um, vector norms. So when x is some element of a vector space, we know that a vector uh, that a vector norm satisfies these four properties. So the positivity property means the norm must be greater than or equal to zero for all x. The, the identity property that says that x is equal to zero if and only if its norm is zero. Um, this is the homogeneity property that says that if I scale the, a vector by s some value, that uh, the norm of that is is the norm scaled by that value. So in general, alpha can be complex, and x is any element of the vector space. And then finally, we have the triangle inequality that says that the norm of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of the norms. So this, these are the definitions for a function for a vector norm. A function norm is basically going to satisfy the same thing, except f instead of having x here, we have f of x. Okay, and so this is how we define this. Um, um, so f of x appears in all of these places. So. Notice that when we looked at the vector norm, you can think of this as being the norm on the input space to the function. Okay, And this function norm is now a norm on the output space of the function. Okay, So in general, we have these four, these four properties. The last one is usually the most complicated to work with. The function norm, this is the, the uh, triangle inequality. And often to to prove the triangle inequality for a function norm, you uh, or for any norm, we generally want to use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So I would recommend that you go back to, I believe it's lecture number two, and there are, are some, some notes, and there's actually a proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So you can see how to prove uh, the triangle inequality, for example. All right. So uh, one way of approaching a function norm is to um, induce that norm based on the vector norms. Okay, so one way is a worst, what's, what's often referred to as a worst case approach or an extreme case approach, which basically uh, says I'm going to take the largest input output ratio, or actually output over input ratio. So this is kind of like a transfer function magnitude. Okay, so I look over all possible uh, vectors on the input space and, and with non-zero norm, and I look at the, the largest ratio. So for some x, I get f of x, that is the has, gives me the largest ratio. You can go through and show that this definition for the function norm satisfies all the necessary properties, and it is an induced norm based on the norms of the input and output spaces. So now, in, uh, in general, we're gonna, when we think about function norms, we're going to be looking at uh, a linear function as our function. And so we can think now in terms of, our, uh, in terms of matrices as the p-norm. So in this case, this is a vector norm. This is a vector norm. This, this p-norm is on the input space, which is an Rn. This is a vector norm on the output space, which is Rm. And uh, so p is some number between 1 and infinity. You can go through and show that if you choose p between 0 and 1, that you don't get a norm. So you actually need to have p between 1 and infinity. So again, this is induced from the vector p norm. And um, such a norm, like this, satisfies what's called the submultiplicative property. That is, if I have two matrices and I take the p norm of that product, that's less than or equal to the product of the individual p norms of the two matrices. So, an important question then is, if so we have this definition for a norm, how do we actually compute the p-norm for a, for a function or a vector? Uh, or a matrix, rather. So again, we have this definition. One way of computing the norm is to find an upper bound, gamma, for this inequality. Okay, so... Um, we have this ratio and we're looking for the maximum. If we can find a value of gamma such that we get this inequality holding for all x, then we can uh, we can compute the norm. 
Um, so that's that's where we start. So if we can find a gamma that is the upper bound, and if we can find a vector so that we get equality here, then p then the the p norm is in fact equal to gamma. So in th in this case, we actually are actually finding gamma, which is the norm, and we're basically proving that that's the norm. So that's actually what this process is going through, and we're proving it by cho by finding a vector. Uh, in this case, the norm of the vector is equal to one. Um, this is without loss of generality, and in which case gamma is equal to a times this quantity. And so then we can go through and show that that's in fact the p norm. So, and again, we're doing this for all p between one and infinity. Now it turns out there are certain values for which this is um, easy, fairly straightforward to do. So we start off with the one norm. The one norm basically is the uh, the, the ratio in the one so if you think of the one norm it's the uh, for a vector it's the sum of the absolute values of that column okay and so the one norm we can go through and, and show is the maximum over all the columns of the sum of the absolute column so in other words we take we take each column in the matrix we take the absolute value take the sum up each column and look at the largest sum and that becomes gamma. And we can go through and show that this vector, zero, where, where we have a one in the position where the lar largest column sum is. So this is just an example. Um, it, it could be the first, it could be the last, it could be whichever, whichever column has that largest sum, that's where we put the one. Okay, and so this is, this is the, the one norm. And we can go through and show that, that uh, using this approach, we can actually prove that this is indeed the, the one norm. Incidentally, if I choose a vector like this, what is the one norm for this vector? Hmm. Should be obvious, but I'll leave you to think about that. All right, the two norm is similar. In this case, the two norm is given by the maximum singular value of the matrix. So the vector that provides the maximum ratio, so this is another way of looking at it, is we take the max where the uh, over all norms of magnitude one uh, I'm sorry all vectors that have norm magnitude one and, and we look at it that way so the vector in this case that provides the maximum ratio is the right singular vector and so we talked about that earlier associated with the largest singular value in which case this is we actually have this relationship that is satisfied and so we can actually go through and show that this gives us the largest, uh, the largest uh, ratio. For the infinity norm, the infinity norm is the p norm as p goes to infinity. We can go through and show that we actually get this. Um, gamma here is the maximum over all the rows. In this case, we do the same kind of thing with the one norm where we took the columns. Here we take the rows. Okay, we take the rows. And in this case, we let the vector that's associated with this be plus or minus one. Um, basically, it's the sign of whatever that row, um, the element, if you look at the elements in any given row, and you're looking at the absolute sum, the sum of the absolute values of those rows. Basically, the plus or minus one is going to be uh, multiplying those, those elements in the row, right? because you have a row times a column. So you have the elements in the row, they're gonna be multiplied by these guys. And so basically the signs of, of each of these guys are gonna match so that it's like taking the absolute value of those elements and then you get the sum, okay? And so that's basically, you get plus or minus one. The signs depend upon the signs of the of that row that has the greatest absolute sum. So now notice that in the one norm, the one norm is that sum of the absolute values of the elements the infinity norm is the largest element in that vector. So, question is, what is the one norm of this vector? I'll let you think about that. In general, for the p norm, so we've done one, two, and infinity. In general, this is again the formula for the for the p norm, which we can also specify this way: the maximum over all vectors, unit vectors of unit norm of a times that vector the p and the p norm. In general, th this approach works for p, uh, 1, 2, infinity, but for any other p, the calculation is 
what's called NP hard, which is, which means that it involves a lot of calculations in general. So there's no efficient means for the, the general values. But MATLAB actually has uh, the ability co to compute the p-norm for any, well, um, yeah, is, it has the ability to compute the p-norm. So, so that's the that's the scoop with the, the p-norms. So the p-norms, again, are induced by the p vector norm in the in the input space and the output space so there are some other norms for matrices that are not induced norms but they satisfy those four properties for a function so here is a what's called a helder norm the helder norm basically is also has like a p and it's the, the sum of all the elements uh, where we take the absolute value raised to the p power and then after you've summed everything up we take the 1 over p power. Okay, so that's the Helder norm. And a special case of that is the Frobenius norm when p is equal to 2. In this particular case, we basically have the sum of all the elements squared, square root. Okay, and it turns out you can go through and show that this quantity can be written as the square root of the trace of A transpose A. So this Frobenius norm uh, is a special case and, and this is so this is easy to compute this is one of the easiest norms to compute because we don't have to find any any special vector and all that kind of stuff we don't have to take any singular values we take the this matrix product we take the sum of the diagonal elements and take the square root of that quantity boom done that's it's really one of the easiest ones now again if you think in terms of what a norm is a norm is basically a measurement of the size of something so so that's basically what uh, what the norm is, and so you would think that there would be relationships between, you know, if, if you have a matrix, you take the two norm, you take the Frobenius norm, you take you know the p the uh, the infinity norm, you, you would think that there would be some relationship possibly between the different norms, and so in, indeed there there is. Um, so for example, the Frobenius norm is the sum of the sum of the squares of all the of all the elements which you can show is actually equal to the sum of the singular values of the matrix it's the sum of the singular values squared so if you take the Frobenius norm squared that's equal to the sum of the of the uh, singular value squared so the sum of the singular values squared this sum includes this the largest singular value squared so this and this sum in general will be greater than this okay and so usually it'll often be strictly greater than this but it's possible there's only one non-zero singular value in which case you, you get equality here and so uh, so for example if you have a dyad and so but this quantity here is in fact the two norm so we can see that the Frobenius norm in general of a matrix is in general greater than or equal to the two norm okay now, in another extreme case, if all the singular values are the same value and it's the maximum value, then the Frobenius norm is equal to n times the 2 norm. So again, the Frobenius norm is greater than or equal to the 2 norm, but we have an equality relationship here. We have an equality relationship. So in general, we can go through and show that the 2 norm is less than or equal to the Frobenius norm, which is less than or equal to root 2 times the 2 norm. I'm sorry, root n. So basically, it's like the square root of this we get, gives us this inequality. Likewise, we can say, we can, so notice that the Frobenius norm is bounded above and below by scalar values times the 2 norm. Here, the 2 norm is scaled above and below by various values of the Frobenius norm. And so we can actually go through and look at several of the different norms and find the relationships. So, for example, the one norm of a matrix is basically equal to the one norm of, you know, the matrix. So, the, the R here refers to 1, 2, infinity, or F. C refers to 1, 2, infinity, or F. And so, basically, this guy, for example, says that the, uh, the 2 norm is less than or equal to root M times the infinity norm where again our matrix is m by n. So notice here we have L which is basically saying that the Frobenius norm is related to the rank of a matrix. 
Okay, so we have those kind of relationships. And so this table shows us uh, upper bounds between every norm and every every of the other norms. So we have the, those kinds of relationships. Uh, the last thing I want to look at is for any induced norm, if we have a square matrix, the spectral radius of that matrix is less than or equal to the norm. So that is the largest eigenvalue is less than or equal to the largest singular value. And we also have this relationship that um, if I take a matrix, raise it to the power r, take the norm of that, and then take the 1 over r power, and if I take the limit as r goes to infinity, I actually get the spectral radius. So it's kind of an interesting quantity there. Also, if I have a matrix 2 norm, that's in general less than or equal to the, in the square root of the 1 norm and the infinity norm. So we have this relationship as well. So again, some relationships, the norms are related. Basically, the sizes are related. So these are norms of matrices. We're going to use them quite a bit because they, they will form a uh, basis of measuring size of, of matrices. And those matrices might be might be system matrices, they might be transfer function matrices. So it's important to understand what we're talking about when we talk about the different kinds of uh, norms for matrices. Thank you.